chapters 10 and 11 of a comic history of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this reading by allison hester of athens georgia a comic history of the united states by bill nye chapter 10 the early aristocracy lord clarendon and several other noblemen in 1663 obtained from charles the second a grant of lands lying south of virginia which they called carolina in honor of the king whose name was not really carolina possibly that was his middle name however or his name in latin the albemarle colony was first on the ground then there was a carteret colony in 1670 they removed the ancient groves covered with yellow jessamine on the ashley and began to build on the present site of charleston the historian remarks that the growth of this colony was rapid from the first the dutch dissatisfied with the way matters were conducted in new york and worn out when shopping by the ennui and impudence of sales ladies came to charleston in large numbers and the huguenots in charleston found a hearty southern welcome and did their trading there altogether we now pass on to speak of the grand model which was set up as a five-cent aristocracy by lord shaftesbury and the great philosopher john locke the cane brakes and swamps of the wild and snake-infested jungles of the wilderness were to be divided into vast estates over which were proprietors with hereditary titles and outing flannels this scheme recognized no rights of self-government whatever and denied the very freedom which the people came there in search of so there were murmurings among those people who had not brought their finger bowls and equerries with them in short aristocracy did not do well on this soil baronial castles with hot and cold water in them were often neglected because the colonists would not forsake their own lands to the thistle and blue-nosed briar in order to come and cook victuals for the baronial castles or sweep out the baronial halls and wax the baronial floors for a journeyman duke who ate custard pie with a knife and drank tea from a saucer through a king charles moustache thus the aristocracy was forced to close its doors and the arms of lord shaftesbury were so humiliated that he could no longer put up his dukes there had also been a great deal of friction between the albemarle or cotteret and the charleston set the former being from virginia while the latter was as we have seen a little given to kindergarten aristocracy and oft times tripped up on their parade swords while at the plough of course outside of this were the plebeian people or copperous culottes who did the work but lord shaftesbury for some time as we have seen lived in a baronial shed and had his arms worked on the left breast of his nighty so these two colonies became separate states in the union though there is yet something of the same feeling between the people wealthy people came to the mountains of north carolina from south carolina for the cool summer breezes of the old north state and have to pay two dollars per breeze even up to the past summer thus there was constant irritation and disgust up to seventeen twenty nine at least regarding taxes rents and rights until as the historian says the discouraged proprietors ceded their rights to the crown it will be noticed that the crown was well seated by this time and the poet's remark seems at this time far grander and more apropos than any language of the writer could be so it is given here quote, uneasy lies the head that wears a seedy crown End quote. the year of washington's birth seventeen thirty two witnessed the birth of the baby colony of georgia james oglethorpe a kind-hearted man with a wig that fooled more than one poor child of the forest conceived the idea of founding a refuge for englishmen who could not pay up the laws were very arbitrary then and harsh to a degree 
Many were imprisoned then in England for debt, but those who visit London now will notice that they are at liberty. Oglethorpe was an officer and a gentleman, and this scheme showed his generous nature and philanthropic disposition. George the Second granted him in trust for the poor a tract of land called, in honor of the king, Georgie, which has recently been changed to Georgia. The enterprise prospered remarkably, and generous, charitable people aided it in every possible way. People who had not been able for years to pay their debts came to Georgia and bought large tracts of land, or began merchandising with the Indians. Thousands of acres of rich cotton lands were exchanged by the Indians for orders on the store, they giving warranty deeds to same, reserving only the rights of piscary and massacre. Oglethorpe got along with the Indians first rate and won their friendship. One great chief, having received a present from Oglethorpe, consisting of a manicure set, on the following Christmas gave Oglethorpe a beautiful buffalo robe, on the inside of which were painted an eagle and a portable bathtub, signifying, as the chief stated, that the buffalo was the emblem of strength, the eagle of swiftness, and the bathtub the advertisement of cleanliness. Thus, said the chief, the English are as strong as the buffalo, swift as the eagle, and love to convey the idea that they are just about to take a bath when you came and interrupted them. The Moravians also came to Georgia, and the Scotch Highlanders. On the arrival of the latter, the Georgia mosquitoes held a mass meeting, at which speeches were made, and songs sung, and resolutions adopted, making the Highland uniform the approved costume for the entire coast during summer. George Whitefield, the eloquent, who often addressed audiences, even in those days when advertising was still in its infancy, and the advance agent was unheard of, of from 5,000 to 40,000 people, founded an orphan asylum, one audience consisted of 60,000 people. The money from this work all went to help and sustain the orphan asylum. While reading of him, we are reminded of our own Dr. Talmadge, who is said to be the wealthiest apostle on the road. The trustees of Georgia limited the size of a man's farm, did not allow women to inherit land, and forbade the importation of rum or, or of slaves. Several of these rules were afterward altered, so that as late as 1893, at least, a gentleman from Washington, D.C., well known for his truth and honesty, saw rum inside the state twice, though bourbon whiskey was preferred. Slaves also were found inside the state, and the Negro is seen there even now, but the popularity of a Negro baby is nothing now to what it was at the time when this class of goods went up to the top notch. Need I add that after a while the people became dissatisfied with these rules, and finally the whole matter was ceded to the crown. From this time on, Georgia remained a royal province up to the Revolution. Since that, very little has been said about ceding it to the crown. North Carolina also remained an English colony up to the same period, and, though one of the original thirteen colonies, is still far more sparsely settled than some of the western states. Virginia Dare was the first white child born in America. She selected Roanoke, now in North Carolina, in August 1587 as her birthplace. She was a granddaughter of the governor, John White. Her fate like that of the rest of the colony, is unknown to this day. End of chapter 10, The Early Aristocracy Chapter 11, Intercolonial and Indian Wars Intercolonial and Indian Wars furnished excitement now from 1689 into the early part of the 18th century, War broke out in Europe between the French and the English, and the colonies had to take sides, as did the Indians. Canadians and Indians would come down into York State or New England, burn a town, tomahawk quite a number of people, then go back on snowshoes, having entered the town on rubbers, like a decayed show with no printing. 
there was an attack on Haverhill in March 1697, and a Mr. Dustin was at work in the field. He ran to his house and got his seven children ahead of him, while with his gun he protected their rear till he got them away safely. Mrs. Dustin, however, who ran back into the house to remove a pie from the oven, as she feared it was burning, was captured, and with a boy of the neighborhood, taken to an island in the Merrimack, where the Indians camped. At night she woke the boy, told him how to hit an Indian with a tomahawk, so that, quote, the subsequent proceedings would interest him no more, end quote, and that evening the two stole forth while the ten Indians slept knocked in their thinks, scalped them to prove their story, and passed on to safety. Mrs. Dustin kept those scalps for many years, showing them to her friends to amuse them. King William's war lasted eight years. Queen Anne's war lasted from 1702 to 1713. The brunt of this war fell on New England. Our forefathers had to live in block houses, with barbed wire fences around them, and carry their guns with them all the time. From planting the Indian with a shotgun, they soon got to planting their corn with the same agricultural instrument in the stony soil. The French and the Spanish tried to take Charleston in 1706, but were repulsed with great loss, consisting principally of time which they might have employed in raising frogs' legs, and tantalizing a bull at so much per tant. This war lasted eleven years, including stops, and was ended by the Treaty of Utrecht. After this, what was called the Spanish War continued between England and Spain for some time. An attempt to capture Georgia was made, and a garrison established itself there, with good prospects of taking in the state under the Spanish rule. But our able friend, Oglethorpe, the Henry W. Grady of his time, managed to accidentally mislay a letter which fell into the enemy's hands, the contents of which showed that enormous reinforcements were expected at any moment. This was swallowed comfortably by the commander, who blew up his impregnable works, changed the address of his Atlanta constitution, and sailed home. Oglethorpe wore a wig, but was otherwise one of our greatest minds. It is said that anybody at a distance of two miles on a clear day could readily distinguish that it was a wig, and yet he died believing that no one had ever probed his great mystery, and that his wig would rise with him at the playing of the last trump. King George's War, which extended over four years, succeeded, but did not amount to anything except the capture of Cape Breton by the English and colonial troops. Cape Breton was called the Gibraltar of America, but a Yankee farmer who has raised flax on an upright farm for twenty years does not mind scaling a couple of Gibraltars before breakfast. So without any West Point knowledge regarding engineering, they walked up the hill, and those who were alive when they got to the top took it. It was no balaclava business and no dumb animal show, but simply revealed the fact that brave men fighting for their eight-dollar homes and a mass of children are disagreeable people to meet on the battlefield. The French and Indian War lasted nine years, from 1754 to 1763. From Quebec to New Orleans, the French owned the land and mixed up a good deal socially with the Indians, so that the slender settlement along the coast had arrayed against it this vast line of northern and western forts, and the Indians, who were mostly friendly with the French, united with them in several instances, and showed them some new styles of barbarism, which up to that time they had never known. The half-breed is always half French and half Indian. The English owned all lands lying on one side of the Ohio, the French on the other, which led a great chief to make a PPC call on Governor Dinwiddie, and during the conversation to inquire with some naivete where the Indian came in. No answer was ever received. We pause here to ask the question, why did the pale face usurp the lands of the Indians without remuneration? It was because the Indian was not orthodox. He may have been lazy from a puritanical standpoint, 
and he may also have hunted on the twenty-seventh Sunday after Easter. But still, was it not right that he should have received a dollar or two per county for the United States? No one would have felt it, and possibly it might have saved the lives of innocent people. The French had three forts along in the middle states, as they are now called, and western Pennsylvania, and George Washington, of whom more will be said in the twelfth chapter, was sent to ask the French to remove these forts. He started at once. The commanders were, some of them, arrogant, but the general, St. Pierre, treated him with great respect refusing, however, to yield the ground discovered by La Salle and Marquette. The author had the pleasure of being arrested in Paris in 1889, and he feels of a truth, as he often does, that there can be no more polite people in the world than the French. Arrested under all circumstances and in many lands, the author can place his hand on his heart and say that he would go hundreds of miles to be arrested by a John Darm. Washington returned 400 miles through every kind of danger, including a lunch at Altoona, where he stopped 20 minutes. The following spring, Washington was sent under General Fry to drive out the French, who had started farming at Pittsburgh. Fry died, and Washington took command. He liked it very much. After that, Washington took command whenever he could, and soon rose to be a great man. The first expedition against Fort Duquesne was commanded by General Braddock, whose portrait we are able to give, showing him at the time he did not take Washington's advice in the Duquesne matter. Later we show him as he appeared after he had abandoned his original plans and immediately after not taking Washington's advice. The Indians, said Braddock, may frighten colonial troops, but they can make no impression on the king's regulars. We are alike impervious to fun or fear. Braddock thought of fighting the Indians by maneuvering in large bodies, but the first body to be maneuvered was that of General Braddock, who perished in about a minute. We give the reader, above, an idea of Braddock's soldierly bearing after he had been maneuvering a few times. It was then that Washington took command as was his custom, and began to fight the Indians and French as one would hunt varmints in Virginia. Braddock's men fired by platoons into the trees and tore a few holes in the state line, but when most of the colonial troops were dead, the regulars presented their tournures to the foe and fled as far as Philadelphia, where they each took a bath and had some laundry work done. General Forbes took command of the second expedition. He spent most of his time building roads. Time passed on, and Forbes built viaducts, conduits, culverts, and rustic bridges, till it was November, and they were yet fifty miles from the fort. He then decided to abandon the expedition on account of the cold, and also fearing that he had not made all of his bridges wide enough so that he could take the captured fort home with him. Washington, however, though only an eighty Kong of General Forbes, decided to take command. His mother had said to him over and over, George, in an emergency, always take command. He done so, as General Rusk would say. As he approached, the French set fire to the fort and retreated, together with the Indians and Molly Maguires. Pittsburgh now stands on this historic ground and is one of the most delightful cities of America. Many other changes were going on at this time. The English got possession of Acadia and the French forts at the Bay of Fundy. In 1757, General Loudon collected an army for an attack on Louisburg. He drilled his troops all summer, and then gave up the attack because he learned that the French had one more skiff than he had. The Loudons of America, at the time of this writing, are more quiet and sensible regarding their ancestry than any of the doodlebug aristocracy of our promoted peasantry and the crested yahoos of our cowboy republic. The Loudons, or Lowdowns, of America had a very large family. Some of them changed their names and moved. The next year, Amherst and Wolfe took possession of the entire island. 
about the time of braddock's justly celebrated expedition another started out for crown point the french under Dieskau, met the army composed of colonial troops in plain clothes together with the regular troops led by officers with drawn swords and overdrawn salaries the regular general seeing that the battle was lost excused himself and retired to his tent owing to an ingrowing nail which had annoyed him all day lyman the colonial officer now took command and wrung victory from the reluctant jaws of defeat for this johnson the english general received twenty five thousand dollars and a baronetcy while lyman received a plated butter dish and a basswood what not but lyman was a married man and had learned to take things as they came four months prior to the capture of duquesne one thousand boats loaded with soldiers each with a neat little lunch basket and a little white flag to wave when they hurrayed for the good kind man at the head of the picnic general abercrombie sailed down lake george to get a whiff of fresh air and take Andaroga. when they arrived general abercrombie took out a small book regarding tactics which he had bought on the boat and after refreshing his memory ordered an assault he then went back to see how his rear was and finding it all right he went back still farther to see if no one had been left behind abercrombie never forgot or overlooked any one he wanted all of his pleasure party to be where they could see the fight in that way he missed it himself i would hate to miss a fight that way the abercrombies of america mostly trace their ancestry back by a cut-off avoiding the general's line niagara had an expedition sent against it at the time of braddock's trip the commander was general shirley but he ran out of money while at the falls and decided to return this post did not finally surrender till seventeen fifty nine this gave the then west to the english they had tried for one hundred and forty years to civilize it but alas with only moderate success prosperous and happy even while sniping in their fox hunting or canvas back duck clothes these people feel somewhat soothed for their lack of culture because they are well to do in seventeen fifty nine general wolfe anchored off quebec with his fleet and sent a boy up town to ask if there were any letters for him at the post office also asking at what time it would be convenient to evacuate the place the reply came back from general montcalm an able french general that there was no mail for the general but if wolfe was dissatisfied with the report he might run up personally and look over the w's wolfe did so taking his troops up by an unknown cow path on the off side of the mountain during the night and at daylight stood in battle array on the plains of abraham an attack was made by montcalm as soon as he got over his wonder and surprise at the third fire wolfe was finally wounded and as he was carried back to the rear he heard someone exclaim they run they run who run inquired wolfe the french the french came the reply now god be praised said wolfe i die happy montcalm had a similar experience he was fatally wounded they run they run he heard someone say who run exclaimed montcalm wetting his lips with a lemonade glass of cognac we do replied the man then so much the better said montcalm as his eye lighted up for i shall not live to see quebec surrendered this shows what can be done without a rehearsal also how the historian has to control himself in order to avoid lying the death of these two brave men is a beautiful and dramatic incident in the history of our country and should be remembered by every schoolboy because neither lived to write articles criticizing the other five days later the city capitulated an attempt was made to recapture it but it was not successful canada fell into the hands of the english and from the open polar sea to the mississippi the english flag floated what an empire what a game preserve 
florida was now ceded to the already seedy crown of england by spain and brandy and soda for the wealthy and bitter beer became the drink of the poor pontiac's war was brought on by the indians who preferred the french occupation to that of the english pontiac organized a large number of tribes on the spoils plan and captured eight forts he killed a great many people burned their dwellings and drove out many more but at last his tribes made trouble as there were not spoils enough to go around and his army was conquered he was killed in seventeen sixty nine by an indian who received for his trouble a barrel of liquor with which he began to make merry he remained by the liquor till death came to his relief the heroism of an indian who meets his enemy single-handed in that way and though greatly outnumbered dies with his face to the foe is deserving of more than a passing notice the french and indian war cost the colonists sixteen million dollars of which the english repaid only five million the americans lost thirty thousand men none of whom were replaced they suffered every kind of horror and barbarity written and unwritten and for years their taxes were two-thirds of their income and yet they did not murmur these were the fathers and mothers of whom we justly brag these were the people whose children we are what are inherited titles and ancient names many times since dishonored compared with the heritage of uncomplaining suffering and heroism which we boast of to-day because those modest martyrs were working people proud that by the sweat of their brows they wrung from a niggardly soil the food they ate proud also that they could leave the plough to govern or to legislate able also to survey a county or rule a nation end of chapter eleven intercolonial and indian wars